We're very fortunate tonight to have Barbara Jackman's going to be speaking to us and uh, around the, the anniversary, coming anniversary of the Singh decision. Just said it's Perfect. quite an honor to have uh, a lectureship named after your honor where Barbara is giving the lecture. Uh, Barbara graduated from law school and within five years she's in the Supreme Court winning one of the most important cases in the, I'd say, in the last 25 years. It's an outstanding case because it makes a radical difference about the defining of the rights of people who aren't yet citizens, that they have rights and similar rights to Canadians, and it makes a difference in how Canada treats people and about the whole human rights regime in the world. It sets an enormous precedent. Um, Singh was my first time arguing an appeal in the Supreme Court of Canada, and the reason that we got involved was I was sitting, I was acting for one of the people on the Grange Commission, the investigation into the deaths of children at Sick Kids Hospital. And Ian Scott sat in front of us, and Ian knew that I did uh, refugee immigration work, so he, get, he was acting for the Sings in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had appointed him. So he passed his factum to us and asked, to me, and asked me to review it. And, I told him that I thought he was making the wrong arguments. He was arguing that, what we call the Ellis Island distinction, he was arguing that if you were at, in Canada, you were entitled to protection of, under Section 7 of the Charter, that you had a right to life, liberty, and security of the person, but that if you hadn't actually come into Canada, if you were still at the border, you wouldn't have that right. That's how the Americans, I mean, roughly, that's the American distinction. The problem was is that six of the Sings were port of entry cases. They had never actually come into Canada. I mean, they'd been in Canada for six or seven years, but they hadn't actually come into Canada. Well, and the court so, accepted the arguments that were put forward by the, the churches and the Sikhs, that everyone meant everyone who was in Canada. So in that sense, it was an important victory. Um, the court decided that life, liberty, and security of person when the Charter said everyone has the right to life, liberty, and secure the person, everyone meant every human being in Canada, whether or not they were lawfully admitted or not lawfully admitted. If they were on our soul, soil, they had the protection of the Charter. The judgment was formative. It sent a message, I think, early in the life of the Charter of rights and freedoms, which was then only three years old, that it was an inclusive document, that it embraced the strangers in our midst, and ensured that they, were, too, were entitled to fair treatment in the determination of their rights. When you think about it, where we're at in Canada 25 years later, I think in a legal sense we are far advanced, and in a structural sense we are far advanced from where we were 25 years ago. But having said that, there are a lot of serious problems that still continue to exist. Um, if you look at the Singh decision, since that time, while the Supreme Court has always qualified its judgments in non-citizen cases, non-citizen cases with the recognition that non-citizens have no right to enter or remain in Canada and that must be the starting point for an analysis of any rights of non-citizens. The court has still maintained the principles that it established in the Singh case in a number of important decisions. In the Suresh case in 2002, the Supreme Court recognized as a general principle of law that Canada could not deport refugees and others in need of safe haven to face torture in another country. Canada, in that case, was to try to deport Mr. Suresh, a leader in the Tamil community, and alleged to be a leader of the LTT, the Tamil Tigers, then involved in an armed conflict in Sri Lanka, back to Sri Lanka where he would be detained, and the human rights reports indicated that people who were detained, particularly Tamils, not just Tamils, but particularly Tamils, were routinely tortured. So search face torture. Supreme Court said you can't do that. I think that if you look at the decisions, there are a lot of problems around um, carrying them out in a fair way with governments, and, and I can't just say it's a single government, maybe bureaucrats, reluctant to apply them. So in, in a sense, when we won the Singh case, I think I even realized then, although I was much more hopeful and, and um, less cynical about the justice system, I think I realized even then that it would still be an uphill battle, that we won the right to an oral hearing, but um, it was going to depend on how they implemented the decision. 
Um, and I think that that gives rise to other considerations around where we're at today. I think that if you look at it overall, structurally, we, have, we are miles ahead of where we were when I first started practicing law. When I started practice, and because of the Singh decision, when I started practicing um, refugee law, my clients would have an interview before a senior enforcement officer. The, they would make a transcript, send it up to a faceless committee in Ottawa who would make a decision and advise the minister whether or not to recognize my client as a refugee. Now we have full oral hearings in front of an independent and impartial decision maker. Um, that's a huge advance, notwithstanding the problems in the system. The problems with it is that the decision makers are key to fair decision making. And if the government is going to, to act in bad faith and appoint people who are not qualified to make the decisions or whose bent is anti-immigrant or anti-refugee, you can destroy what looks on paper to be a good system. I think it's no surprise that in recent year, or the recent year, I mean, there was an article in the paper a while ago that the refugee acceptance rate dropped 56 percent um, in the last year. Um, so that doesn't speak well of an effective and robust and viable system if it can drop that quickly because of a change in government. Um, secondly, I think one of the key problems with the current system, even though we have oral hearings, is there's no effective review. They passed a law saying that we would have a refugee appeal decision, division. We never got it. The third issue with uh, an effective refugee system, aside from those two issues, is that is the lack of resources. I mean, for, for a long time, they weren't appointing board members under the current government. From what I understand, there's something like a 60,000 backlog of claims. When we succeeded on the Singh case, I don't know if any of you, some of you may remember, but there was a backlog program because there was a backlog of cases the government couldn't handle as a result of the Singh decision. They were cases that all had to be given an oral hearing after the Supreme Court said they were entitled to one. 23,000 cases. That was the backlog in 1985. We now have 60,000 in the normal course. There's no backlog program or no amnesty for them. But if you don't put in enough resources, you're not going to have an effective system. People shouldn't have to wait a year and a half to get their refugee claims decided. One of the, the problems I find in terms of doing this work, and I was talking to Shari at the table about it, is the enormous human cost um, as a result of ineffective or unfair systems um, that we have in place. So you've got to remember that some woman comes and makes a refugee claim. She may have had to leave her two little children behind takes a year and a half for her to get her refugee claim on, and then the landing process takes another year to a year and a half. I mean, how long is she separated from her kids? Like, it's really, really a terrible system when it doesn't work properly, and it's a terrible in terms of the human cost on people. Okay. Going to court, I still am a strong believer that if we didn't have Singh, if we didn't have Suresh, if we didn't have Shakawi, we'd be worse off, and that eventually, you know, you just keep going back and knocking on the door of the court and trying to make them see that this is wrong, that eventually they'll see, and that someday, you know, it will improve. But it's got to improve not just in a legal sense. I mean, the, the words written by the court are wonderful, but in practice, the governments have to carry them out, not try and obfuscate or obstruct them. There are a lot of people in Canada today who would not be here, but for the fact that they got a hearing before a tribunal into their, in their claim for refugee status that led to their acceptance and their permanent residence and ultimately their citizenship in Canada. One should not underestimate the force and importance of the equal entitlement to be heard and to be listened to. And in order to fully, to give full meaning to an entitlement to be heard and to be listened to, you have to know what's being said about you. And so that leads us into questions, for example, of disclosure and so on. And how do we, you know, there's an important moment, I think, in making your stand as equally human in that moment of saying, I'm entitled to know what you're saying about me and I'm entitled to speak and, and to be heard.